Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Junkyard Dogcast. I'm your host, Jordan Hill. Got Kip Adams and Ben Wolk with us on this Monday afternoon. A little bit different this week uh, with uh, some stuff going on on Tuesday, figured, and also some developments over the weekend. We didn't want to wait around. We wanted to jump right in and, and catch up with everybody as we get ready for another Busy week of sports, and uh, with March Madness still going on, with Georgia Spring Practice going on, figured we would go ahead and get going with a Monday episode. Uh, wanted to start at the top with some of the news that we learned about Georgia on Sunday. Running back Trevor Etienne was arrested in Clark County early Sunday morning for misdemeanor charges, including driving under the influence of alcohol. Uh, we have not heard any official statements from Kirby Smart. I'm sure Kirby is going to mention this when we talk to him on Tuesday. Obviously, it's not the news that anyone wanted to hear about the former Florida running back who transferred to Georgia. All of a sudden, you know, we sort of wonder what this is going to look like going into the season. I think it's probably a safe bet that uh, we may not see Trevor in that Clemson game. Uh, but again, we haven't heard from Kirby Smart yet. Uh, I'll just set you guys up for this and, and ask you first, Kip. Um, just what you expect out of this and what Kirby may have to say when we talk to him on Tuesday. Well, I think Kirby's probably going to say that he's disappointed that it happened and that there's a standard uh, at Georgia and that, you know, every single one of his student athletes uh, is expected to uphold that standard and that Trevor made poor decisions. Um, you know, if, if he is, you know, this charge stands, then, yeah, I don't think you have to make the assumption. I don't think we would expect Trevor to play in the Clemson game. But there's a long time until then. And, you know, as of now, they're just, you know, they're charges. So anything can change between now and then. And I think that I think Kirby's going to mention that we're going to wait and see how, you know, everything takes care of itself and handle it. And he probably won't, you know, give any more details because at this point it's still legal matter. Uh, but the fact is that it happened and it shouldn't have happened. And I don't think he'll shy away from admitting that. Ben, any thoughts uh, on this situation? Yeah, I think, I mean, we don't know yet what Kirby's thoughts on it are. I don't think that he's going to share a whole lot of it on Tuesday beyond to Kip's point, probably his disappointment level that it happened. Like you both have said, I think similar incidents have gotten a one game suspension so i think that that's where I, I would lean but i doubt that kirby smart reveals any of that tomorrow i mean he has no reason to issue any kind of public punishment at any point really so i'm sure it'll be a lot of early mornings and late nights for uh, trevor etn over the next several months as well but um yeah just not uh not not the news that most folks wanted to wake up to on a sunday morning i'm sure Definitely, and we'll make sure and pass along any more information we get on it. Again, what Kirby says on Tuesday. Um, also, once a police report becomes available, we're going to make sure everyone over at Dogs 24-7 has all of the information regarding that situation. Well, fellas, let's turn our attention back to this past weekend and a lot of recruiting news. Ben and uh, everybody really around the Georgia uh, network was very, very busy with uh, several different developments, both good and bad for the Bulldogs. Uh, Georgia added 2024 three-star defensive tackle Stefan Shivers on Friday. And then on Saturday, they landed 2025 four-star quarterback Jared Curtis, should say 2026 four-star quarterback Jared Curtis. And then a little bit of bad news also on Saturday with a five-star defensive tackle Justice Terry flipping his commitment from Georgia to USC. So, Ben, let's just start generally with all these different moves, uh, what your big takeaways were from – uh, the news from a very busy weekend. Well, my biggest takeaway is that you rattling off those three pieces of news right there can kind of give people an idea of what to expect over the next several weeks, months. I mean, this really is the time of year, I would say, from early to middle of March to the end of June, middle of July, where basically everything is going to unfold. You're, you know, we saw last recruiting cycle what the schedule of events will sort of look like in terms of when schools are going to be building their recruiting classes. Uh, I think Georgia will have most of its class publicly together by the end of June, early July or middle of July. And, you know, there might be a few pieces here or there throughout the fall that end up changing, but certainly a lot of news this past weekend, both good and bad. And I'm sure we'll dive into more of those specifically too. 
Well, Ben, let's just pick up with the quarterback situation with Jared Curtis, 2026, number one player in the 2026 cycle right now, choosing Georgia. One, what did you make of that news that Jared Curtis was pledging to the Bulldogs? And what does it mean for 2025 with a lot of intrigue around Georgia with what they're going to do with the quarterback spot? Well, for starters, I was a little bit surprised by the timing of Jared Curtis's decision. The actual decision that he made, I wouldn't say, was that surprising. I think it's been trending that way really since last fall. He came for a visit in September, really enjoyed the trip, started building a connection with Mike Bobo. His original relationship was with Todd Munkin. So I think that there was a little bit of a growing period there for Mike Bobo to build back up that relationship with Georgia. But by the time he had visited in September of last year, I think Georgia was really the team to beat. I think that Ohio State at one point in the recruitment had been the team to beat and sort of faded away a little bit there. And so, you know, I, I am not surprised whatsoever that Jared Curtis is the quarterback in Georgia's 2026 class, especially once Julian Lewis officially reclassified to 2025. And, you know, I it's a huge recruiting win for Georgia to get that staple member of your class in place. It's been a while since Georgia's had a quarterback in place for an extended period of time to sort of build around. I mean, I know that Ryan Puglisi essentially was that. But then when Dylan Riola came into the picture, it sort of changed things as well. So it's been a while. And I think that for the 2026 class, Jared Curtis, he's the number one player in the class. He is big, talented. I was talking to his quarterback trainer earlier today, and he was comparing him to Josh Allen from a size, skill set, arm talent perspective. And so, you know, whenever you're making those types of comparisons, there's obviously a lot of physical ability there. And so I, I think that it's big for Georgia to get that 2026 quarterback in place. What I think is fascinating about all of it and where the surprise might have come a in a little bit from a timing standpoint is Georgia doesn't have its 2025 quarterback in place yet. And we've talked a lot about Julian Lewis. Matt Zollers is visiting on April 2nd he, and he's making his commitment on April 4th. So there's going to be a lot of movement happening at quarterback in the 2025 class over the next few weeks, you know, m maybe into months with Julian Lewis probably being a little bit more delayed in any kind of final decisions than Matt Zoller's is. But Georgia clearly wanted to get its 2026 quarterback in its in its room, probably so that it can have those conversations with the 2025 quarterbacks and say, here's what's going to be here now. Here's what's going to be here in the future. You know what to expect and what room that you're stepping into. So whether it is Matt Zollers, whether it is Julian Lewis, whether it is Ryan Montgomery, whoever it ends up being in the 2025 class that's Georgia's quarterback, they know exactly what quarterback room that they're stepping into. Now, I know that the question will be thrown out, does Georgia hit the transfer portal at quarterback? And I think that that's certainly a possibility as well. But I think for the purposes of securing the quarterback spot for Georgia in the 2025 cycle right now, and I think that that will be decided here in the next few weeks or maybe into June, just depending on who the quarterback ends up being. But I think that being able to say to them confidently, you know who the 2024 quarterback is that has come in, you know who the 2026 quarterback is going to be, and there's no, you know, games that you have to play from a recruiting standpoint to make sure that a quarterback is comfortable with the decision that he's making because he knows confidently who's coming in behind him in 2026 already. Kip, just along those same lines, what do you make of sort of the musical chairs that, that comes with recruiting quarterbacks and, and the situation Georgia's in right now, both having Jared Curtis in 2026 and still trying to fill things out when it comes to 2025? Well, I know a lot of Georgia fans saw the news with Jared Curtis and kind of approached it with a little bit of skepticism. I know that, you know, a lot of Georgia fans are still, you know, a little bit uh, nervous about just considering any qu quarterback commitment on the list. But the good news is Jared Curtis isn't a, you know, a legacy recruit for another program. So you don't have to worry about him going to, you know, a random Big Ten school, uh, you know, on signing day. And then at the same time, I do kind of compare it to Ryan Puglisi because he committed way back in October 2022 and, Sign with Georgia 14 months later. Well, if we have an early signing period, Jared Curtis could potentially sign with Georgia 14 months after his commitment. You know, if we have this early signing period at the end of May or in June, then his commitment could last just as long as Ryan Puglisi's. And 
for him, it's, you know, you don't know what cor- Georgia's quarterback situation is going to look like when he gets there. But, I mean, that could be true of the quarterbacks in the 2025 cycle. You know, what happens with Gunnar Stockton? Is, you know, where does he move in, in Georgia's quarterback depth chart after this season? Where is Ryan Puglisi when all is said and done? You know, you, you're not sure what's going to happen with these guys, but, they're, you know, they're going to be competing. And then whoever Georgia brings in this cycle will be trying to compete with those guys. But, you know, any one of those guys could leave via the transfer portal before uh, Jared Curtis ever steps foot on campus. So I think for him, it's a situation that he doesn't have to worry about right now. But regardless, I think, you know, he knows coming in that he's going to have an opportunity to to really compete for, for playing time when he gets there because chances are, I mean, it's there's not going to be four quarterbacks on campus when he gets there. It's just – I don't think any program is going to be able to really maintain that type of depth that we had in years past at the quarterback position. So I think for him, it's there's not really anything for him to worry about. Uh, he go ahead and get his commitment out of the way. And uh, it's a great, I mean, you can't ask for a better uh, first commitment to start off the 2026 cycle. And so now Georgia can kind of hone in, find its 2025 quarterback. And I mean, I, I still, I'm not sure, uh, that they're done with 2024 at the quarterback position. I mean, we saw them try to get another quarterback in the transfer portal, and you know, and it came as close as you can get to, to landing a guy that probably would have been able to, to compete for the backup snaps this year. So, you, know, you, you watch his spring transfer portal window. I think they'll be evaluating all any of the quarterbacks into the portal again, and that's just going to be how every off season goes for a program like Georgia. I think Kip's absolutely right. I think it's going to be interesting to watch once spring ends and that transfer portal opens i believe it opens the tuesday after g day so there's going to be a lot of intrigue there and yeah just fascinated to see what this quarterback situation specifically with the 2025 class how this plays out you know we'll have much clearer answers over the next month and everyone watching and listening you guys know to go to dogs 24 7 we will have it covered and uh, it's going to be fascinating to see for sure so we mentioned earlier those developments when it comes to the defensive line. Uh, Some good news for Georgia, some bad news for Georgia. Let's start with the good with Stephon Shivers. I am going to, as Ben and I were talking about before, uh, Shivers, not Shivers. Uh, He commits, obviously, a lot to like there. Ben, what can you tell us about Stephon and uh, what uh, he brings to the table? Well, when everyone talks about the Jordan Davis replicas that George is always looking for along the defensive line, I think a lot of times that gets overblown because there's not many body types like Jordan Davis. And not to say that Stefan Shivers is exactly that, but when it comes to just sheer physical stature, you're not going to find many nose tackle options like Stefan Shivers. You know, he's six foot five, 350 pounds. I'm sure by now a lot of people listening or watching this have seen the clip of him playing running back last year and running for a 63-yard touchdown, and it's honestly a laughable visual watching some of the guys in the secondary try and bring him down because they can't catch him because they're not quick enough to catch him, but they're also just half the size of him physically, so they just really didn't stand a chance. So that's an incredible visual if you haven't gotten a chance to look at that yet. But I think the big thing is – There's not many, and we've talked about this before with other people that can fit into that zero tech defensive line role for Georgia. There's not many people that physically can play that role out there. I mean, the options, every recruiting cycle are super limited. And I think that's why you've seen Georgia get creative with some of the body types that they've gone with at that spot. Like Namdi Agboko, for instance, last cycle, much different body type from from Stefan Shivers because there's not that many people out there that are six foot five, 350, but also have the foot speed to be able to do the things you need to do to disrupt up front the way you need to in Georgia's defense. And so I think that, you know, Georgia's taken a creative approach at times trying to find other options. But I think when you find someone like Stefan Shivers that is of the size that he is, this is a guy that is a 1000 point scorer in his high school career. And he just finished his junior year. So think about that. You know, you've seen the clip of him running as a running back, obviously a thousand points at the high school level through three years is remarkable for anybody, but somebody that's, you know, six, five, three fifty, you're, you're not assuming that person is moving well enough to be able to score a thousand points. No problems to first of Shivers. So I think that 
from an athletic standpoint, it makes perfect sense. It's exactly the prototype that Kirby Smart and Trey Scott love to have there. You know, it's interesting. This is a guy that I saw out at the Combine in San Antonio at the All-American Bowl in January and really impressive. Like, of all the people that were in attendance, the number one person that was there that I was like, wow, who's that? What's the backstory on him? And I'll admit at that point in time, I didn't, I knew that Georgia was involved and he had communication with Trey Scott, but I really never would have imagined back in January that he was going to be in Georgia's class by the end of March. That said, it makes perfect sense having seen him and what he brings to that zero tech. And, you know, talking with his coach who, you know, all coaches are going to give positive feedback about their players, but you can really tell when someone has a passionate sort of emotional feeling about a player that they have. And that's exactly how Stefan Shivers coach reacted to him ending up at Georgia and just talking about like, yeah, this is a guy you look at his size and you assume he's absolutely a nose zero tech. That's all he can do. But his coach really believes that's not the case. He thinks that he's someone that could even play a little bit of three technique that you can move around because he does have the quickness of somebody that's probably more in that 300 to 305 range than somebody that's 350, which I think it'll be really fun to watch. Now, turning and looking to 2025 five-star defensive tackle Justice Terry, his decision to flip his commitment from Georgia to USC, obviously that was a big development as part of a really big weekend for USC. Ben, what did you make of that situation with Justice? And uh, do Georgia fans still have some hope given where we are in the calendar and uh, still trying to chase after Justice Terry? Well, I definitely think that there's some hope. I mean, we've seen this time and time again with early commitments of guys from the state of Georgia that Georgia really, really wants. You don't just win that recruitment and then go on your way and say, ah, oh, we, yeah, it's nine months till signing day, but we've already got it in the back. That's not how it works in these recruitments. And I know that people will always go to the, you know, most recent example of that. So I know KJ Bolden's a name that's going to come up a lot when we're talking about that, just because we just saw it happen recently, but there's plenty of other names that we can point to and say, you know, this happened. I mean, Micah Williams is going to be a very popular name because it was a USC commitment and flip and how that all transpired as well. So again, we've seen it time and time again. I don't think that it's a guarantee that, you know, Georgia doesn't sign, Justice Terry or Isaiah Gibson, who also committed to USC over the weekend. That was a top, top Georgia target at edge as well. So I think my big takeaway from it is clearly USC is doing something right this time of year. I know that, you know, I, I spoke with Isaiah Gibson briefly yesterday and, you know, he was just really speaking highly about Eric Henderson, the defensive line coach that they've hired out there. And I think that there's a lot of positive energy around him right now i think that he is showing a lot of you know personal motivation to recruiting i think that it's important to him coming from the nfl ranks to show that he is passionate about the recruiting side of things and there's a reason why he made that move and so i think that that's showing up early i think that with justice terry you know that's a big loss for georgia i don't want to sugarcoat anything kip and i just saw him in Carrollton a couple of weeks ago at the U under armor atlanta camp and he was arguably the top performer out there. I mean, you you look at him and you say, oh, that's a Georgia defensive lineman. And so I think it's smart of USC if they're trying to sort of rebrand how people view them. I think they need to do it up front along the defensive line. And I think that if you're going to improve your defensive line, what better people to recruit than the defensive linemen and edge rushers that Georgia wants? Georgia's had the success with it. You should probably try and replicate that as much as possible. So you know, certainly ruffled some feathers in Athens this past weekend. I don't think Georgia was fully expecting some of the news that came out of the weekend with Justice Terry flipping, with Isaiah Gibson committing to USC. I think both of those things caught folks in Athens off guard a little bit. But, you know, asking around on just what's going on in U at USC, how what is the reaction in Athens? I think most of the feedback I've gotten is it's a long, long way till signing day. And so I think there's a lot of cards left to play for both sides between now and December. And so I think it just makes things a little bit more interesting. I mean, Justice Terry, we knew that he was going to be taking these visits. He'd taken visits to other places, not just USC either. And so I think that there was maybe some writing on the wall that his commitment wasn't as secure as Georgia might have felt that it was. But I think now it certainly turns the switch for Georgia to say, all right, if we really, really want Justice Terry, which I think that Georgia does, 
what do you have to do to get him back, you know, in your good favor? And I know that that communication is going to be open, you know, from now until December. Justice Terry is certainly not going to be cutting Georgia off anytime soon. Ben mentioned Michael Williams, and it was funny after that commitment, looking at our Twitter notifications at Dogs 24-7, I, I looked at one point, and for some reason, the story where Michael Williams flipped his commitment from USC to Georgia was getting pinged a lot. I guess that was just coincidence. Had nothing to do with the Justice Terry news. Yeah, interesting coincidence. Kip, what do you make of the Justice Terry situation? The fact that he flipped and just, you know, what this is going to be like with USC apparently getting a little bit of momentum uh, after guys that, as Ben pointed out, uh, Georgia really, really wants. Yeah, they have. USC right now has, I think, one uh, less – a commitment from the peach state than Georgia does. I think they got three now. Georgia's got four. Um, I mean, yeah, they, they, they love the state of Georgia and, and why shouldn't they, you know, uh, I think this is, this is where you go at several positions to get the the best talent in the country. I know Lincoln Riley have, has tried to make, you know, the Atlanta area a priority and they have a whole new co uh, defensive coaching staff. So all the negative recruiting you have against USC's defense, you could, you know, you, they could sell them on a completely new staff. And obviously, we're right there, Henderson. I mean, he's selling the fact that he coached Aaron Donald the last couple of years. And even though Trey Scott has a lot of feathers in his cap with first round picks coming out of Georgia, it's, you know, you can't, you, you can't really compare that to having coached, you know, the greatest defensive lineman of, of our generation. Now, you know, I think you and I, you know, the three of us could have coached Aaron Donald to a couple, you know, Pro Bowl, um, you know, honors. But, you know, again, you still get to have that when you're out there recruiting, you're going to living rooms, you're going to high schools during the spring. And 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 that's exactly what Eric Henderson did whenever he was out there, you know, in the last couple of months and, and making stops in, in Georgia, making sure to let everyone know. Like, hey, you know, I, I have this to lean back on. And and then when you visit, it, you have an Aaron Donald, you know, on campus to meet with recruits. It, you, you get pumped for that. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, covering, you know, I know that we don't get to do this anymore, but we used to get to cover a, a camp in Athens called Dog Night. And, uh, you know, Georgia had five commitments uh, all, you know, one night. Uh, you know, it was Bryce Ramsey. You had – uh you know, uh, I think it was uh, Tramel Terry out there. Um, and then you also had Derrick Henry committing. And I remember just all the guys getting him amped up. And then he went and he pulled the trigger. And then just knowing there's no chance that commitment sticks. I mean, it was, it was, and then they were excited. It was a big moment for Georgia. He got to write all these, you know, commitment stories uh, for the different guys. John Theus, I believe, as well. Um, and, but the, the Derek Henry commitment was, everyone was kind of like that came out of left field. That wasn't one we saw. Well, I don't want to say that's where justice Terry is right now, but I do know that obviously these guys got really amped up. Uh, they, they joined a recruiting class on the other side of the country. And now the real world uh, begins for USC trying to, to keep these guys in the fold, knowing that every single weekend uh, they're going to there's going to be an opportunity for these guys to visit Athens for Kirby Smartest coaching staff to have another chance to recruit them. So, yeah, I think uh, it's big news for them right now. And it's also just lets Georgia know that this is where the you know what we have to do. The communication obviously needs to ramp up between Georgia and Justice Terry. Um, I don't there's not a lot of defensive linemen like him in this class. I think that, you know, we talked about the depth along the defensive line in Georgia. Well, it does start with Elijah Griffin and Justice Terry. I mean, you have your nose tackle in this class. It took you, well, you know, to the end of summer to find that in the last cycle. I think it's great that you're taking a nose tackle every cycle. You got to do that. You know, you saw what happened when Bear Alexander, of all people, you know, left via the transfer portal to go out to USC, just kind of that that hole in the depth chart that now you, you need to go ahead and make sure you fill in every cycle. But uh, I just think there aren't a lot of guys like Justice Terry. And just to keep that going with Isaiah Gibson, I uh, just – I don't love the edge class uh, nationally at that position. And while there's guys that could play different roles at Georgia, you know, Isaiah Gibson being a guy that can be that Mikel Williams, that hybrid type, you know, the thought of Jared Smith, the measurables are great, uh, you know, him being uh, – 
out of Alabaster, Alabama means you're going to have to, you know, probably work as hard as USC is with with their guys to to get a guy like Jared Smith in the fold. But there aren't a lot of guys uh, that play either position the way that Isaiah Gibson and Justice Terry do. And so th those guys now Kirby Smart knows, OK, this is the competition. This is what we got to do. There are a lot of other names at both positions in this cycle. It's very early. But I just think it's just the battle lines have been drawn now, and those recruitments aren't going to stop anytime soon. I was going to say, Kip, you know, it's basically the shots fired and a uh, long way to go, as both you guys have pointed out. I want to make sure I kind of have my notes wrong that I was reading earlier. Shivers and Terry are both 2025 recruits, and you got Jared Curtis in 2026. We're going to make sure and clean that up. Uh, take a quick break, come back, talk about spring practice. And talk about the Georgia men's basketball team still playing with April in sight. Guys, I don't know if you feel this way, but I really think that spring practice is flying by. We're now in the third week. Uh, when Georgia returns to practice on Tuesday, that'll be the start of the third week. Um, they've already had nine practices at this point. They have been super busy uh, with going through and uh, getting ready for uh, the end of spring, trying to get in all the work, trying to get in the reps, and obviously finishing out strong at G-Day on April 13th. But I want to kind of take it uh, around uh, to both of you guys and just discuss what sort of stood out to us at this point. And I'll start just because I put a note uh, on the junkyard earlier on Monday talking about the competition at cornerback. And dang, I got to do this a second time today. I got to shout out Kip for calling this uh, as one of our bold predictions uh, with Georgia and the cornerback competition. I mean, continuing to see. Uh, that, you know, Dalen Everett doesn't necessarily have that spot locked up. There's been a lot of buzz about Daniel Harris and Julian Humphrey working with the first team. Again, I don't think this is a situation where things are locked down and uh, that, you know, Dalen does not have a chance to start. Uh, but it really sounds like those guys, along with Ellis Robinson, have, have been impressing, trying to show that they're up for the challenge. And uh, I think it's really fascinating. I think it sets up for – What's going to be interesting to hear out of these next few weeks and then obviously what we see at G-Day. Uh, but, yeah, to me, that's sort of my big takeaway from what we've seen and heard uh, here lately through this point in spring practice. Ben, what do you make of what you've learned? Uh, what stands out to you about this Georgia team as we get ready for another week of spring ball? Well, I think the secondary side of things is fascinating, and I think that's a reason why Kip and I both probably had bold predictions about the secondary is just because it is an area that has more uncertainty than just about anywhere else on the team. And I think that what you're alluding to there in terms of what that cornerback rotation looks like is part of it. I think who the second safety alongside Malachi Starks is a big part of it. And then I think who plays star now that, you know, there's the the stars of, of past you know, Javon Bowler's gone. Tyke Smith is gone. What does that look like this season? And I think that part of what's happening at cornerback is Georgia trying to figure out who their best star options are as well. And we know that they, you know, have some safeties like Janelle Aguero, like Jake Pope, like probably KJ Bolden that's getting early work as a young guy as well that could probably play a little bit of both. I think that the same might be said for some of the cornerback options as well, potentially including Dalen Everett. Like they have a skill set that could potentially cross train at multiple defensive back spots. And I think that now is the time that you test out all of your various rotations, combinations, who fits best where and who, you know, when you're looking at best 11 or when you're thinking about the secondary, you know, best five or whatever that might look like uh, typically, who, who makes Georgia's secondary the best. And I think that that's what's happening right now. And I think that that 
rotate, you know, as they get into more scrimmages and then ultimately into the spring game, I think that you're going to see who performs the best in those various spots. And so really, you know, you brought up what I would probably have brought up first and foremost is just the secondary, I think is the most fascinating in terms of how all of that rotates. Tuesday will be the seventh practice. Numbers are really throwing me for a loop on this episode of the Junkyard Dogcast. Uh, Kip, uh, what stands out to you from just what we've learned and what we've heard about this team? Um, and anything in particular really catch your attention where we are at this point in practice? So far from everything we've heard, uh, Colby Young's got a chance to be the real deal. Um, I think he's one of those guys where you just – you know, you, you're you're hoping he can come in and, and compete in a wide receiver rotation and, you know, give you some of, of what you're losing with Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, hitting on the NFL, uh, but also just knowing that, you know, you're, you're losing a lot of production with Brock Bowers, but it just sounds like he's turning a lot of heads. And I, I think they're just, you know, really impressed with what he's shown so far. So I want to continue to see that and, you know, what I want to see, well, now I want to see Roderick Robinson. I mean, if you're talking about G Day and what we need to see, um, as of now, I mean, he could be RB1 for what should be a pretty, you know, big season opener against Clemson. So you, you've you heard good things. He's getting work with, you know, first, first team snaps as they're rotating the guys in. And, but, you know, hearing more about him kind of, uh, you know, performing well and continuing to have good practices, I mean, now this kind of moves up uh, the list a little bit overall. So, you know, want to want to continue to hear good things about him. And the one thing I just glad we haven't heard anything yet and we'll be watching on DJ G day is Jared Wilson snaps, you know, um, that's one of the things where when you're taking a guy that, you know, didn't play predominantly center at the high school level um or you know for those remember like trey hill uh, a guy that just slid over the center and as a blocker was outstanding you, you would have some snaps here and there that you know wouldn't be ideal you just want well, you just want to see how jared wilson handles that you know with increased playing time so that's kind of the other thing if you don't if you don't notice him on g-day probably a great thing right just like cornerback position you don't want to hear about him so that, that's kind of so far so good there. And you just want to come out of this thing with, with no injuries and, uh, you know, not hearing much of, of anything except for uh, Carson Beck kind of taking that next step like Stetson Bennett did when he returned as a second-year starter. I'll throw out, too, what I've heard. Good things on Jalen Walker. And he's a guy that, again, I think we came out of last season saying – I don't know how they have to do it, but they have got to get number 11 on the field more. And again, it'll be interesting. You know, it's hard to find, kind of get a feel for what they're going to do specifically at inside linebacker because Smile is not practicing the spring. But is he a guy that we may see getting more snaps at inside linebacker? I think he's a guy that whatever you do, you have to get 11 on the field more. I think the coaches have come to that agreement and just fascinated to see what exactly that role looks like for him this season. And while we're calling out people that I've heard some positive things about, just some two incoming freshmen that, uh, you know, I've heard some buzz about is KJ Bolden, which I don't think is a huge surprise from a talent standpoint, but I think that anytime someone has the sort of recruiting hype that he had coming in, there may be not concern isn't the right word, but just wonder about what the transition is going to look like. And it sounds like he's exceeded all expectations. And so I don't want to say it's been a nice surprise because I'm sure Georgia folks are not surprised because that's why they recruited him the way that they did. But someone that has really just attacked his off season, you know, weight gain goals, things like that. And I think someone that, um, popped you know we we talked to a few people that were out at the coaches clinic over the weekend and i think kj bolden came up just about everybody that i, I talked to as well and then joseph jonah Ajanye is someone that i've heard has had a lot of flash plays early on and you never i never want to hype up a person in the trenches as a freshman just because it's so hard to crack the lineup at georgia as a young guy and he came in especially young too but just somebody that i think has a really a lot of upside at georgia We'll get a chance to talk to Kirby Smart and some more players on Tuesday afternoon. So I would tell everybody to keep an eye out there and uh, we'll have plenty of stories out of that. Something else that is going to be going on Tuesday, Tuesday night, 
Georgia men's basketball will be back in action. Georgia beat Wake Forest 72-66 to on Sunday in the second round of the NIT. So they move on to the quarterfinals where they will be playing Ohio State. I wrote about this in a column on Monday, but this is about as positive an end to the season as Georgia could have hoped for, given the circumstances, given how rough the end of the regular season was. But guys, I don't know if you guys have been watching this team. I've been pretty impressed. They were like a nine and a half point underdog at Wake Forest. Didn't have Russell Chiwa, didn't have Jabri Abdul Rahim, didn't have RJ Sunahara. And yes, Wake was going without their leading scorer. But uh, I thought they did a really good job. Ben, did you have any thoughts on how they've been playing lately? Well, I think any time that a team's leading scorer goes out, like, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes before tip, it's definitely, it helps the defensive side of things. And I think that showed up in the first half because Wake just really struggled to find ways to score the rock. But I will say, first time in 26 years, I think it is, that Georgia's won multiple postseason games. And I know that people that live in the NCAA tournament will probably laugh at Georgia for celebrating an NIT run like that. But I mean, when you're talking about a program, you know, everyone talks all the time. What does Georgia basketball have to do? What is Georgia basketball has to win games that people are watching nationally. And I know that not everyone's watching the NIT the way that they're watching the NCAA tournament, but winning multiple NIT games against brands like Xavier, like Wake Forest, it goes a long way. And it proves that, yeah, you you know, took your punches at times throughout the SEC slate. But when it got down to the end of the season, Georgia basketball is still playing. There's a lot of SEC teams that are not still playing. And I know that they got poked fun at for trying to make a joke about that on Twitter. And I understand that as well. But Georgia basketball is still playing. And I think that that's really important because how often are we sitting here on March 25th and Georgia basketball still has relatively meaningful games against big brands that are going on. It doesn't happen very often. And so I think it's a huge win for Georgia. I think that it's also proof that, you know, Mike White, for whatever reason, people love to poke holes into his coaching acumen whenever Georgia has late game breakdowns or they start to struggle throughout stretches of the season. And I've said it multiple times, Georgia wins the games they're supposed to win and they lose the games that they are supposed to lose by and large. And this was another example of a game like the South Carolina game earlier in the year that Georgia was an underdog. They were on the road. They were not supposed to win this game and they won the game. And, you know, quite honestly, it was pretty convincing for a lot of it until Wake Forest snuck back into it there toward the end of the second half. And so, you know, again, I think that this is another notch for Mike White as look, you're building a program. There's positive progress that you can really point to and um yeah ohio state on tuesday will be an interesting one kip any thoughts on uh, how georgia's been playing on the hardwood here lately listen i mean georgia did something that duke north carolina um virginia uh, none of these teams beat wake forest at wake forest this season so um i think again um Hats off to this team. Uh, I think when you shoot almost 52% from three and you actually make your free throws, I mean, what was it like 14 to 17, 14, 18, something like that. Thank you. I mean, like that's it. Uh, that that's, that's how you play winning football. It's been, you know, frustrating to watch them. I mean, again, still in the second half, you still had to kind of go through the Georgia men's basketball experience of, of watching a team, come back from, you know, what, 20-whatever point lead to, to make it a close game. Um, but that's still a character-building experience, and it just shows you even more what potential this team has if he can actually keep this roster together. And you want to talk about the double-digit teams that, you know, turn down, the you know, the opportunity to play in the NIT uh, because of recruiting, whatever. But Mike White takes his team out here and now probably has an opportunity to tell this team, hey, uh, th this showed what, what you guys can do. Uh, and so I, I just think that, uh, you know, the, regardless of what happened against Ohio State, but especially if, you know, they continue their run, uh, this is the kind of momentum that maybe you keep a guy or two on your roster that may have been thinking, you know, I don't have an opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament next year at Georgia you're knocking on the door now. I mean, again, like I said, you beat, uh, you went 2-0 against Wake Forest. I do think that the only other team to beat Wake Forest, you know, at 
in their in their uh, own court is is Georgia Tech. So I just think that's kind of funny that the you know the Georgia teams did that. But still, uh, yeah, I mean uh, an NIT road win. You haven't seen that this century for for Georgia. So it, it's huge, and that is uh, you know you can make all the jokes you want about how long it's been since they've done this, they've done that. But I mean they've done something here that is now the answer to a trivia question. You know you get to update that. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be putting up a banner because of that, uh, but at, for Georgia basketball, you got to start somewhere, and this is where they're starting. Let's see where it takes them. Georgia will be back in action 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. That game will be on ESPN. Ben mentioned the NCAA tournament, and we got to return to the conversation he and I had on the last episode. We gave our final four picks. I want to get an update on where everyone's bracket is, and I'll start with mine, down to two Final Four teams, with Houston, who had to go to overtime to survive against Texas A&M, and Creighton, who had to go to double overtime to survive against Oregon. So I lost Auburn, uh, and I also lost, gosh, I can't even remember who my other team was, but I'm down to two out of four. Uh, ben, how are things looking with your bracket? Well, basically all my upset picks didn't hit, but I will say my final four is still looking okay. I have, uh, I've got UConn, Arizona, Houston, and Tennessee, and then I've got a UConn-Tennessee championship. So Tennessee, Texas got a little bit dicey there at the end of uh, at the end of the second half. It was tough for anybody that hypothetically might have had Tennessee minus seven and a half. It felt like that was going to hit the whole game until it didn't. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I'm feeling okay about my final four right now. I felt like all four of my uh, final four teams played pretty well the opening weekend. Baylor was my other team. Mm. that wound up uh, the, the mighty Clemson Tigers. Put them Clemson's out. always sneaky in the tournament. It's just, you got to watch out for Clemson for sure. Uh, Kip, we didn't get to get your final four picks. So if you did fill out a bracket, what did you have and, and how are things looking? I did. I have uh, almost the same as Ben. I have UConn, Arizona. I had Colorado just because uh, I think they have a couple high draft picks on the team. I was kind of looking toward the NBA and wanted to see these guys kind of stand out and, and uh, improve their stock. And then I had Tennessee. I have UConn beating Tennessee. And so uh, I saw when Ben posted his bracket, uh, I was like, that looks very familiar. So, um, you know, I don't want to say great minds, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess I got lucky. I, I hit the copy paste, uh, copy Ben's bracket, and uh, it's working pretty well for me so far. Well, I think I did. Uh, I think I did McNeese State, who lost by 40 in the first round. I think I had Samford winning, who lost by double digits in the first round. I think my only real Cinderella pick that I had, I took Grand Canyon to my Sweet 16. And I thought that was going to happen for a minute there last night, but um, I still feel okay about picking Grand Canyon, even though nobody really knows if it's real or not. Maybe well, if the they Grand Canyon. Know. We know the Grand Canyon's real. We just don't know about the university. I was going to say, I don't know if this is some weird conspiracy I'm not aware of, but and also if maybe they would have, you know, run an offensive set in that game, maybe they would have beaten Alabama. We talked about Bryce Drew when we were talking about this last time. And you, cause I think I was going to take him to the Elite Eight. And then you made a comment when we were on here about Bryce Drew. And I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. And I think that uh, that played out yesterday when they went a whole half without running a single, any, any kind of offensive set. Yeah, I think uh, I definitely had McNeese State, and like you said, they got blown out. Did have James Madison. Uh, really, the rest of my picks didn't do that well. But I do want to shout out my dog, Maya, who picked Yale over Auburn because her rule is always you got to go with the dogs. The dog and mascot. I should have listened to her because, boy, it did it totally torpedoed my bracket. Yeah, well, uh, our cats picked Kentucky to win the championship for the same reason. So, you know, sometimes those plans backfire. We're going to wrap it up right there. I appreciate everybody for watching this live, everyone who's listening to and watching it after the fact. Appreciate Kip and Ben for popping on with us on this Monday afternoon. If you haven't already, go to dogs247.com, subscribe, make sure that you are all signed up for the rest of spring practice and all the recruiting news and intel that's going to be coming out of these next few weeks. Go to YouTube, subscribe to Dogs 24-7. You'll get the Kirby Smart press conferences here during the spring. Player interviews. May have some more Mike White press conferences and, and player interviews the way that this uh, NIT run is going. Um, also go to TikTok and follow Dogs 24-7. Got a lot of content there as well. So for Kip Adams and Ben Wolk, I'm Jordan Hill. Until next time, take care,